Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. A whole string of firsts. Our first look at the federal sex crime charges against former subway spokesman Jared Fogel. Charges that he's pleading guilty to. Sex with minors, child pornography. The details paint the picture of a child predator. Also tonight, another first. The first polling that shows Donald Trump sharply closing the gap in a general election matchup against Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump right now holding his first town hall event, taking questions from an estimated 1,200 people at the Pinkerton Academy in Derry, New Hampshire. That's by our reporter's count. Mr. Trump claims about 2,500 people. Let's listen in. And they saw so many people killed violently and viciously. The other night, the woman, 66-year-old veteran, raped, sodomized, brutally killed, by an illegal immigrant. We gotta stop, we gotta bring back our country, we gotta take it back, we gotta take it back. Okay, yes ma'am, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, yes sir, young man. Hello Mr. Trump, Hi. my name is Caden. I wanted to know if being president is so hard, why do you wanna be? President. Oh, that might be the best question I get all night. Great question. So if being president is so hard, why do I want to be president? Because I love this country, and I know that I can make it great again. I know it. For you, you know? And, and really for you. These folks, they've seen it, but it's for you and people your age, because when they get to be our age, if we keep going the way we're going, it's going to be a very unattractive picture. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. I um, went on your. I was coming today, and I went on your website to see some of your policy positions, and the only thing there is immigration reform. So I was just wondering, can you speak to any of your other plans for policy? Well, I did a big policy position on immigration, and I think most people really like it. Certainly. Uh, it seems that it's been, it's been very popular. We're going to be doing a lot of policy positions. And, you know, I, I say this and I mean it. When I want a deal, I don't sit down and say, well, let's see, I'm going to get 14 points. You know, the press, I actually think the press, are you a member of the press? I actually think, I actually think the press wants policy, you know, the so-called policy positions more than the people, if you want to know the truth. Because when, when I sit down, and I, I really enjoyed, and I really feel we've hit something special with the immigration policy position. It's very formally done, done with a lot of people, including Senator Sessions, who's a terrific guy. <laughs> terrific guy. And, and, but, you know, when I do transactions, I've made a lot of great deals. I don't sit down and say, well, let's see, I'm going to mark down 14 points. First thing I'm going to do is call somebody. Next thing I'm going to do is get on an airplane. Next, you know, it doesn't sort of work that way. You go in and you get it. Uh, Doral in Miami, everybody wanted it. I heard it might be available. I got on a plane, I went down, I scooped it up before anyone knew what the hell was going on. Does that make sense? We got to, you know, we have to have flexibility. When you do 14 points, you know, the second point may change. And it may be much better than the second point you put down on the policy position. Maybe much better. And that will throw off the rest of the points. But they'll throw it off for the better. I'm doing the policy positions, and I'm doing tax papers. I want to put H&R Block out of business because it's too complicated. No, it's too complicated. But when it comes to policy, I'm going to give you wonderful policy positions. But I just want to tell you, the great people, and this is including politicians, of which there are very few. There are very few. But because they're only good at one thing, and that's getting reelected. And that's really all they care about, if you ask me. But it, it's really true. Are there any politicians in the room? Because there are. I'm not, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about everyone else. <laughs> but, but if you look at policy positions, we're going to be putting out some very good ones. But you need flexibility. And if you don't have flexibility, you're not going to make the great ones. I mean, flexibility in the proper way. The proper way. As an example, I could give you policy on dealing with China. China is killing us. China has taken so much of our wealth. They've taken our jobs. They've taken our businesses. They've taken our manufacturing. The land? Let me think about that one. The way they're going, they'll have it pretty soon. 
But China has taken so much from us. And then think about it. We have rebuilt China. Somebody said to me, and I said, wow, that's a harsh statement. It's the greatest theft in the history of the United States. Now, I have great respect for China and their leaders. And I, hey, look, the largest bank in the world is from China. They're a tenant in one of my buildings. I love China. I think it's great. But we don't have the people that know what they're doing. So we have lost. I, I, you can't just go say, I want power. You go in. They just devalued their currency the other day. Two decades, the biggest they've ever had. They're killing us. You know what that is? They call it a sucking action. Every time you see them, you know what the sucking is? They're sucking the jobs and the money right out of our country. That's what they're doing. We've rebuilt China. You go in, not to mention the name George Washington Bridge, because I know that's a very ticklish name around here. But you go and you see the George Washington Bridge. They have many bridges that are bigger going up. They have bridges. They have roadways. They have airports. Other countries, same thing. And we're like a third world. Have you seen LaGuardia Airport recently? It's like a third world airport. Kennedy Airport, like a third world airport. LAX in Los Angeles. Newark Airport. All of them. We're like third world. They're taking our jobs. They're taking our money. And here's the beauty. We owe China $1.4 trillion. So think of it. This is like a magic act. They take our jobs. They take everything. And we owe them money. How does that happen? It's magic. It's magic on their side, not on our side. That's not going to happen with Donald Trump. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen when I tell the Carl icons and others like Carl, do me a favor, take a look, because it's not going to happen. And here's the funny part. We will have a better relationship with China and a better relationship with Japan and a better relationship with Mexico. We don't have a good relationship with Mexico, right? Do we have a good relationship? Remember Sergeant Tamarisi? Right? He kept him in jail. We couldn't get him in. We had a president who didn't even want to make a phone call. He was in that jail, rotting in that jail. And I helped him with Greta and some people. And I helped him financially. And finally, he got out. But he was in there so long. She was terrific. By the way, without her, you probably wouldn't even — he'd still be there. But — but they don't respect us. I would say, let him out. Let him out now. He will be out. He will be out. It's the messenger. No, it's the messenger. You know, I'll give you another example. I mean, if you look, our four prisoners. Now, I think a nuclear deal is very important, but we should have doubled and tripled up the sanctions and made a real deal, okay? Because I think having a deal is great. But we have to have a real deal. The worst thing we can do is a bad deal, and that's what we have, right? But we have four prisoners. Was three. Now it's four. They added the reporter. But we had one in there because he's a Christian. He's a minister. Because he's a Christian. He's in jail. We don't have anybody even talking. So I say, how do you make a deal without getting them out? And the, before they even started, Kerry, who's a baby. I mean, here's a guy who goes on a bicycle to go on a bicycle race. He's 73 years old. He's in a bicycle race. He falls. He breaks his leg during the negotiation. And I tell everybody, and you probably heard it, I swear to you, I will never be in a bicycle race as long as I'm president. I... But, but you, look at, you look at what's going on, and you look at a deal where we have these four people there. So you do at the beginning. It shouldn't be now. By the way, now is inconceivable after what they got, that we don't even get these four guys out, is incredible. But at the beginning, they should have said, fellas, let the prisoners go. Going to help us all. You don't need them. Your people don't even know they're there. Let them out. It's good for us, good for you, good for the deal. Sets a good tone. Let them out. 95% sure I'll get them. If I don't, I walk. Because you know what? If they wouldn't do that, you're not going to make a good deal. Now, Kerry and President Obama, when they asked him about the prisoners, one of our reporters of — where's our CBS reporter there that did such a good job? He, he was very brutal, but did a very good job. He asked a simple question. What about the prisoners? And what President Obama said, and what Kerry said — and Kerry said it like — 
it was inconceivable. I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't want to complicate the negotiations. Do you believe this? That was his answer. He didn't want to complicate the Where do these people come from? You know, it's interesting. We're fighting against them in Yemen. I guess, in theory, we're fighting against them in Syria. We're fighting all over the place. They don't want to talk about those things as part of the deal because they don't want to complicate a deal. And then you, you get a deal signed. They're dancing in the streets of Iran. They're calling for the destruction of Israel and the destruction of the United States. And we're saying, when do we sign? I never saw anything like it. I've never seen anything. You know, I did write The Art of the Deal. Did anybody ever hear of The Art of the Deal? Good. Donald Trump tonight in Derry, New Hampshire, fielding questions from a town hall audience for the first time as a presidential candidate, one of six Republican candidates holding town halls in New Hampshire today and tonight. Coming up next, we'll ask our GOP insiders what they make of it all and the new polling information that shows Donald Trump closing in on Hillary Clinton in the general election. We'll hear from Jeb Bush, who just moments ago took a sharp jab at Donald Trump. That and a lot more when we come back. The breaking news tonight, Donald Trump in New Hampshire holding his first town hall tonight as a candidate. Chris Christie also speaking right now. Jeb Bush just wrapped up his town hall where he said this about Donald Trump. Mr. Trump has clearly got talent. I mean, there's no denying that. He's, he's uh, won over a lot of people. People are very angry about the, how Washington's not working. He's tapped into that. I respect people that feel the way they do, for sure. But when people look at his record, it is not a conservative record. Even on immigration, where it's, you know, look, it's the, the, the language is, is pretty vitriolic, for sure. But hundreds of billions of dollars of cost to implement his plans is not a conservative plan. Why don't we support, and this is going to be my pitch, let's support someone who you don't have to guess where he, where he stands because he's consistent, because he's been governor and he consistently views, has the views that he has. Joining us is Republican strategist Alex Castellanos, also CNN political commentator and Trump supporter Jeffrey Lord, who served as White House political director during the Reagan administration. With us tonight as well, Amanda Carpenter, former communications director for Senator Ted Cruz. So Alex, I mean, the fact that Trump is now within six points of Hillary Clinton, this is an entirely new position for him. Yep, it is. He's grown. And he was just an anti-Washington vote, stick your finger in Washington's eye. That has evolved into a, hey, we kind of like this guy, a pro-Trump vote now, too. And we saw why tonight in that town hall. I mean, that was masterful political performance art. This is one of the world's great political salesmen who understands the nuances of politics. But underneath it, we saw someone, I think, who's really not a Republican or a conservative. He told us what he was about tonight. Give him power. Give him the power to fix things. He's fine with more power in Washington, as long as the losers aren't running it. He is. You know, and what, what does that mean? Give him the flexibility. Don't worry about those plan details. He'll figure that out. Give him the power to deport 11 million people. Give him the power to deport kids, children who are American citizens and take their, their citizenship away. So Donald Trump is about more power for Donald Trump. This is how a nation turns to a political strongman when it thinks things are falling apart. So it's wonderful art, but it's also very scary. Jeffrey, what about that? I mean, to, to Alex's point, that's really a message not quite as extreme uh, that we heard, or not, not as extreme from Jeb Bush tonight, that, that Donald Trump really is not a, a true conservative. You know, I used to hear that Ronald Reagan was too extreme to ever be elected president. Gerald Ford said that, as a matter of fact. And that was in 1980, in March 1980, when Reagan was well on his way to winning the Republican nomination. So we've sort of been down this road before where people try and scare people away and say, oh, well, he's too much of a strong man, whatever Alex's uh, description of him was there. I, I just don't think the American people are buying it. And, and you have to look at the, at the size of the audiences that he's, he's getting right now as compared to Jeb Bush's audience. Well, um, Republicans have you know, bought again, it, but I'm, Democrats and independents have not. And that's the question for Trump. Well, Can he grow? He's grown in the Republican Party, to his credit. You know, it was just an angry mob that wanted to burn down Washington. Now a lot of Republicans are, in fact, beginning to like him. Amanda, do you, do you believe that he can grow among Democrats, among independents? 
<laughs> sure, he has the potential, and I think those are great observations from both Alex and Jeffrey, but here's what I think is really going on. I don't pay as much as attention to what Trump says as to how the other candidates react to Trump. What I think going on right now in the end, in the Republican primary, I think there's going to be kind of a consensus moderate candidate and a more conservative candidate, and that will be the battle. Right now, no one really has claimed that mantle. So you have this wild card, Donald Trump, who's claiming about a quarter, one in every four GOP voters right now, because the other guys, I don't think they've really defined themselves as voters yet. You have played that clip of Jeb Bush reacting to Donald Trump. Why isn't he pushing his 4% growth plan? Why isn't he establishing himself as a candidate on a specific issue? Because that's all that's going to get played. Um, and so I think they're just getting sucked into the battle. You saw Walker get sucked down to this earlier. And now Trump is more uh, electable than Bush and Walker, according to your new poll. Alex, when, um, when the field is kind of narrowed down somewhat, does that give, I mean, to Amanda's point, one or two other candidates I mean, does Trump have a lot more growth within the GOP or uh, do, do, you know, if the field is lessened, do one or two other candidates get more of a boost from that? I think Trump has kind of solidified himself and grown within the GOP. There isn't a lot of room for him left in the GOP now. For further growth, he's got to grow with independents. He's got to grow with conservative Democrats. He's done a little bit of that, but it's mostly within the GOP. What should happen now is at some point as this field narrows, you know, we're right now the Republican Party is dating the girl in the red dress and it's summer. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to marry that girl later in the fall when the election starts and you get serious. Trump gets away with a lot of this outrageous stuff precisely because he's not a serious candidate for president. That's why these things don't hurt him. People don't really, aren't saying send him to the big seat. They're just saying send Washington a message. When these outrageous things he said actually start hurting him, then you'll know he's become a serious candidate. Jeffrey, do you think that point will come, that they actually will start hurting him? Or does he continue to defy kind of all the political laws? I, I think he continues to de defy, if you will. I mean, when you look at the size of that crowd there tonight, I mean, they are extremely interested in Donald Trump. They're not just about sending a message. They want something done. And, you know, I've, I have always believed that we were going to get down, long before the, the Trump phenomenon sort of began, that we were going to get down to one insider and one outsider. I think we know who the outsider is. The question is, who's going to be the other? And, and as that CNN poll revealed, boy, He's leading uh, Jeb Bush in all these categories by, you know, as much as 30 points in some cases. That's a, that's a pretty interesting set of numbers right there. Uh, Amanda, do you think the people, though, in that audience, are, are, that a percentage of them are there just to kind of be part of the experience and to see what it's all about, not necessarily because they think they want to end up sending him to be in the most powerful position in the world? Yeah, I think there's a huge curiosity factor, and apparently, uh, Alex, I'll stay away from the red dresses coming up from now, but it is sort of that idea. Uh, let's see what he's about. And I think it's very interesting. You can't put him in a box. We know he's not a conservative. He's not a Democrat. He's not quite an independent. People are trying to figure out what he is that's interesting. He says provocative things. He pushes other candidates into taking other positions. And so it is part of a show. But that said, you know, a quarter of the people are very intrigued and are willing to give him a vote. I think those people could go to other candidates eventually. Hmm. Uh, they'll find other people to date to continue that analogy. <laughs> uh, but the other candidates do have to woo them to some degree in the coming months. All right. Uh, Amanda Carpenter, great to have you on. Jeffrey Lord, Alex Castellanos as well. Coming up much more on the new CNN poll that Amanda and Jeffrey just mentioned on how Donald Trump stacks up against Hillary Clinton. Coming up next, Mr. Trump's conversation today with our Chris Cuomo. Talks about where he gets his military advice and what shapes his view of the world. Some fascinating answers and questions from Chris when we come back. Donald Trump tonight just wrapping up his first town hall, taking questions from voters in Derry, New Hampshire, earlier today. He fielded plenty of tough questions from New Day's Chris Cuomo. The conversation airs as a CNN special report right after us at the top of the next hour. Here's some of that interview. When you think about uh, ISIS and what you do to stop them, 
How much of it for you is about the military? How much of it for you is about doing other things, political things to strengthen the regions that they're preying upon? Well, I think a lot of it is about the military. And I think one of the things I noticed in your poll, I came out way, way ahead of everybody on the economy. And a lot of people weren't surprised to see that. But I also came way out ahead on the military. And, and I think, ISIS specifically. And ISIS. I think that I will be a great sleeper on the military because people wouldn't think it's my strength, but I think it would be one of my strengths. I want to build up our military. I want to have such an incredible military that nobody's going to play games with us, nobody's going to mess with us, and hopefully we won't ever have to use our military. I would build up our military so strong, so powerful that nobody will mess with us. So you said something earlier about the poll that you came out ahead on ISIS. That was a surprise to people. One of the reasons but not to me because I talk about it a lot. I understand, but one of the reasons it might have been surprising is something else you said, which is that you get a lot of your military analysis from watching television. Well, that I, see, I didn't exactly say. I watch your show and I watch other shows, and you have on the best generals, we the do. best every retired we have people. Great staff. Okay? Frankly, probably better than I could get. In all fairness, you know, what do I know? I'm going to. I'm a man that made a great fortune. I'm going to make our country rich, and I'm going to make our country great. But you know what? You do, and get me the right generals, and I'll see four or five generals. I'll see all sorts of people. You'll even stoop down to the colonel stuff. You go all over the place, but you have a lot of different people, and so do other shows. And they're really good people. And I watch that, and I read the Times, and I read the Wall Street Journal, and I read lots of other newspapers. But you need a team, don't and you? I read magazines, especially Time Magazine this week because I'm on the cover. Okay, so I especially will read that. <laughs> but I, I read magazines, and I read other things. Yeah, sure, I need a team. But you know, by the time you get to a problem, you know, we're talking a long ways away, it's going to be changed. You're going to have a whole different set of, I mean, different countries will be run by different people, in all fairness. But you'll have someone like I your watch, opponent, Jeb Bush, who says, I have a policy team, a staff. He doesn't have one. He says he does, okay? Look, he can sit, he's a very low energy person, Jeb Bush. He's got very low energy, which is okay. It's good if you want a little, you know, lead a long life. But he's a low energy person. Perhaps he sits down all day long with a particular general. But you know what? I can get a lot of information in a very short time. Now, I've met with numerous people. I was given the biggest award by the Marines the other day, just about one of the biggest civilian awards by the Marines the other day. I was with all of the Marines. I was with the head of the joint, the new head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's a very impressive guy, um, at the Waldorf Astoria the other night. I was given, you know, one of their most distinguished awards, which was a great honor for me. So you're saying they respect so I you? Meet, I think they do. I mean, I think, well, I got the award from them, mm -hmm. and uh, they presented it to me, so I think they do. But when I say that, a lot of people thought that was very smart. You know, you, I, I watch all of the shows. You get the best people, you know, because even the generals want to be on television, right? Or they're retired generals in many cases. But I see a lot of good things by watching your show and other shows. And it's really nothing to be laughed at or scoffed at. And Chris Cuomo joins us now. He was talking about this award he got from the Marines. What, do you know what he was meant, talking about? Yes, but I don't think it was exactly what he thought he was talking about. He didn't get an award from the Marines, as far as we know. The Marines put out a statement saying the U.S. Marine Corps hasn't presented any awards to any presidential candidates this year. It's not customary for the Marine Corps to make uh, such presentations. So it wasn't the Marine Corps. It was a charity that has the Marine Corps name in it that's actually a law enforcement charity. Okay. And that's who he got the award from. Okay. You also talked about his position on, on the 14th Amendment, which says that any child born in this country is an, is an American citizen. How does he plan to reverse that? He really doesn't. And this is what, you know, you've sat with him a couple of times, and I think you're going to get a different look at Donald tonight, Donald mm -hmm. Trump. This is the front runner, Donald. This is him being a little bit more cautious. Cautious for him. Right. He says, oh, there are a lot of people who agree with me. And I say, nah, there's not really that many people who agree with you. SCOTUS has talked about this. This is a minority legal opinion you're talking about. And he goes, it would take eight years for me to change the amendment. I think I can get it done legally. And, you know, we'll figure it out because I think we can get a law done. He's not clinging to that. Mm -hmm. He's using the power of its persuasiveness with his base. Mm -hmm. But he is not promising to deliver on it. I think he's seeing it more not as an action item, but as a statement of intent for it, him. It's interesting because that's what he does with, I mean, and he said this publicly, that's kind of his whole philosophy about having policies. He says it seems like everything is, a lot of things are kind of negotiable. Like, you know, he doesn't want to have a 14-point plan because during the negotiation, if point two doesn't work out, he wants to be able to maneuver 
for the best, in his words, the best deal. Yeah, so he, he is playing on a rational notion of variability, that things change, you have to be flexible. Right. But I think that he will see over time that that's not how this particular game is played. He's making the rules early on here, right. frankly, because the rest of the field isn't running the game on him. But eventually, while well, he says, that, well, the media mostly wants him, yeah, we do. Uh, we want the plans because the responsibility, uh, as you do very well in your show every night and in everything you do, is to your audience mm. and to best equip them to make the decision. Right, and you need to know what the guy's going to do, not just a guess at it. Chris, thanks very much. Look forward to this interview. You can see the entire interview tonight. It's a CNN special report coming up at the top of the hour right after this program. You won't want to miss it. Coming up next, though, new CNN polling just out that shows Donald Trump's appeal growing outside Republican voters. He's now a general election threat to Hillary Clinton. We'll run the numbers. Donald Trump, Jeb Bush, Chris Christie, Scott Walker, Carly Fiorina, and John Kasich all holding town hall meetings today or tonight in New Hampshire, all except Donald Trump, facing a completely different political landscape than the one that they or we or just about anybody expected only a couple weeks ago. The polls have been spelling out just how different, and tonight, as we've been mentioning, we have yet another big one, a real eye-opener for the Clinton campaign, new CNN polling that shows GOP frontrunner Donald Trump now closing in on Hillary Clinton. Tom Foreman has been crunching the numbers, joins us with more. This latest poll, Tom, still shows a Clinton lead, but that gap does seem to be tightening. Yeah, this is something that people thought was impossible in the political scene here in D.C., that he could actually threaten her in a head-to-head -head race for the White House. But he has been closing this gap for some time now. Take a look at where he was back in June when he was trying to mount this charge against her. No one was taking it seriously because he started off at 24 points behind her. Then, as we move into July, you see him come rocketing up to 16 points behind her. Again, people are saying that's not enough to make a difference. It's not a credible threat. And now look where he is today, just six points back. And this has happened in a very key way. Basically what's happened is he's had momentum trending up while she's had momentum trending down in a different way. And all you have to do is look at the Democratic race to see her part of the equation here. Look what happened with her and Bernie Sanders, her nearest challenger. Back in June, she had 58% support. He had 15% support. Since then, she has dropped to 47% and he's nearly doubled his numbers. This is still a substantial lead. There's no reason for her to think that she's being threatened for the nomination itself, but it does show a weakness on her part, and there's been some strength shown on Trump's part. And, and one of her big weaknesses is her unfavorability rating, and that, that's a, a huge problem as well. Yeah, her supporters say when people bring this up, it's sexist, it's unfair, they have a million things to say about it, but you got to look at these numbers because this makes a difference. Back in September of 2011, this is one of her better times in all of this. Look at this. Back then, her unfavorability rating was only 26%. She was quite well liked. But watch what's happened over time. It has clicked along and moved up and moved up and moved up. And now, Anderson, with 53% unfavorable opinion out there, this is the highest, worst thing she's seen in 14 years and something you know her campaign does not want to see now. She still does have, I mean, a, a strong lead. Yeah, there's no question about it. And she has a strong lead for very basic reasons. People trust her on the issues. Democrats out there still believe, for everything else they may think about her, that she'll be stronger in handling the economy, race relations, foreign policy, income gap between the rich and the poor, high ratings on all of that. Quite simply, Anderson, they say for everything else, they still think she's their best choice for president. Tom, thanks very much. Senior Washington correspondent Jeff Zeleny has been reporting extensively on the Clinton email story, which has almost certainly been factoring to some of her poll numbers. Also with us tonight, former Obama senior advisor Dan Pfeiffer. He's now a CNN political commentator. So, Dan, I mean, the fact that Hillary Clinton is down, Donald Trump up in that hypothetical general election matchup, what does it say about how this race is unfolding? They're both getting a lot of attention. It just seems to be hurting Clinton and helping Trump. I think that it's important to have a little perspective here, Anderson, which is Hillary Clinton is beating Donald Trump by six points. She's not going to beat the Republican nominee by more than six points. That would be a massive electoral landslide. Trump has gained primarily by consolidating Republic, the Republican Party. I think this poll tells you more about Trump's capacity to win the Republican nomination than how he would do in the general. Look, the Clintons have had a, Hillary Clinton's had a really hard summer, but if you come at the end of that summer and you're beating all of the Republicans by a larger margin than Barack Obama beat Mitt Romney, I think you got to feel pretty good about that. 
so Dan, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, Republican folks who don't like Donald Trump I've had on this program who say, look, there's no way he's going to be the GOP nominee. You think it's very possible he could be? I think so. He, he, every time people predict the um, demise of Donald Trump, he gets stronger. And if, as his numbers grow with Republicans, he is more likely to do it. If you want, compare Donald Trump's town hall today to Jeb Bush's town hall today, it's really hard to see how Jeb Bush, as Donald Trump says, low energy, not a lot of passion, is going to do better than Donald Trump. Yeah. So he's got a, he has a shot. He could implode, but he has a shot. Jeff, I mean, it, it's not only just the general election, though. Hillary Clinton's numbers are down in the primary as well. She's down nine points. Bernie Sanders up 10 points. How is her campaign, I mean, how are they spinning all this? Or are they even trying to? Sure, Anderson. They're trying to focus on the positive. And the fact is, she's at 47 percent. She still is in the most enviable position of any candidate in the race on either side. Anyone would change places with her right now. So they believe that they are still in a strong position. But they're watching Bernie Sanders very carefully, mainly because of this enthusiasm he's generating. She, I mean, we talked about Donald Trump versus Jeb Bush. You could draw a similar comparison to Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton. There just is not the enthusiasm. There's not the, the passion and the drive um, surrounding her. And perhaps that um, is in large degree because they put her in smaller settings or quieter town hall meetings. But this is a woman who could be the first woman president. This is a historic nature of the candidacy. But people are more excited about the 73-year-old Democratic Socialist from Vermont. So the Clinton campaign is watching the message carefully. But they believe at the end of the day, his candidacy does not hurt hers. His voters will ultimately support her because they generally agree on probably at least 80 percent of the issue set. Dan, does Hillary Clinton have an authenticity problem? I mean, we, we know her favorability ratings are, you know, are the lowest they've been since since 2001. And the more people have seen of her on the campaign, the, the lower they have gotten. Um, do you think she has an authenticity problem? Because, I mean, you could make the argument that voters view Donald Trump as authentic. They view Bernie Sanders as this authentic person. Do you think they don't feel that about her? Well, I think she has a she carries a lot of baggage that goes back to the, the Clinton wars of the last 20 some years. The email situation and the intense press coverage of it has not helped that at all. What I think the question will be is. Hillary Clinton and her campaign need to change this race. So it's not, do you trust Hillary Clinton? It's, do you trust Hillary Clinton more than Donald Trump? Do you trust Hillary Clinton more than Jeb Bush? And if she can turn this into a comparative exercise because of her issue advantage, as Tom noted in the poll, then I, then I think she will come out ahead. But that's the, that's the pivot they're going to have to make as we head into the fall. And, and, but Jeff, we, you know, we are still in this sort of, and I mean, voters are still in this kind of holding pattern on Vice President Biden's decision on whether or not to run. The poll numbers that show a majority of Democrats now want him to run won't that be difficult for him to, to just dismiss? Sure. I mean, Vice President Biden has been in the public arena for so long. He loves campaigns more than most anyone I can think of. He's run for president <laughs> twice before. He must love these poll numbers. I mean, 53 percent of Democrats want him to run. That even includes many of Hillary Clinton's own supporters. Among her supporters, half of her supporters want him to run for a couple reasons. They're hungry for a competition. They're watching all of this play out on the Republican side, and they want more of a competition. They're also hedging their bets. They are still wondering or concerned, could something happen to uh, Hillary Clinton here? So Joe Biden, I'm told, is not going to make his decision only by poll numbers. It's an internal thing, a personal thing. But I promise you, Anderson, he loves these numbers. <laughs> uh, Jeff Zeleny, thank you. Dan Pfeiffer, thank you. Very fascinating. Just thank ahead, you. former Subway spokesman Jared Fogle in a court today as part of his deal to plead guilty to child pornography charges and to paying to have sex with teenage girls. The details about what he's admitting and the prison term he could get next.